thank you very much. Uh, so uh, before we start, I would like to um, thank the organizers for organizing this uh, great and wonderful uh, conference. It's really um, a great pleasure to, to see so many people coming together and, uh, and work on uh, related topics. So that's, um, that's really very inspiring. Uh, then I wanted to mention that, um, that we are going to start a new uh, lecture series also on Zoom, the Leuven uh, Seminar in Classical German Philosophy. And um, so there will be a handout and also the, uh, the link will also be uh, at the bottom of the handout. So uh, we hope that uh, some of you will be able to, uh, to join us uh, on Zoom. And the first uh, talk is uh, next Thursday, October 15, by Michael Olson. And I now hand over to uh, Pavel. Thank you very much. Okay. So just a minor point, it doesn't matter that much, but I'm at Newcastle uh, University, not Heidelberg. Never been to Heidelberg, I'm sure it's lovely. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna dive right in. There's a, a handout PDF that's been transferred. Um, let us know if if you didn't receive it. Um, I'm going to read off uh, a short introduction for the sake of precision, and then Car and I will talk through the different parts of the um, of the paper. Okay, so while Kant is not mentioned in the structure of scientific revolutions, Kuhn in the early 1990s referred to his own work as an instance of post-Darwinian Kantianism. So he mentions Kant a lot, actually, as we'll see. In a 1995 interview, moreover, Kuhn mentions that reading Kant as a student was, quote, a revelation. Be that as it may, we hold that this early encounter with Kant does not explain the affinities and differences between Kant and Kuhn's conception of scientific rationality. The most obvious way in which structure departs from Kant is its shift towards the way in which particular scientific paradigms emerge, prevail, and are superseded by others. However, Kuhn was not the first to introduce the Kantian idea of a priori conceptual schemes into the history of modern science. We know that Kuhn took inspiration from French authors who during the early decades of the 20th century turned to the history of the sciences to capture forms of scientific rationality in the making, including Meyerson, Metzger, and Coiré. We also know that their views in turn were informed at least in part by neo-Kantian readings of Kant. Since these French authors relied more explicitly on Kant than Kuhn does in structure, we believe that comparing Kuhn's account to the French tradition might shed light on the Kantian and non-Kantian elements of structure. We will try to clarify these elements by focusing in particular on Helen Metzger. As we will argue in what follows, Metzger was more critical of neo-Kantianism than her contemporaries. We would like to suggest this also applies to Kuhn's approach to the history of modern science and thus that the positive and negative ways in which Metzger and Kuhn relate to Kant's legacy converge in interesting ways. Kuhn notes in the aforementioned 1995 interview that he quote, thought extremely well of Metzger's work and that it was of some importance to him, but without specifying in which sense. In order to bring out the convergence between the philosophical aspects of Metzger and Kuhn's work on the history of science, we will discuss their ideas from three angles. So first, their understanding of the relationship between philosophy and history. Second, Kantian elements in their account of scientific thought. And finally, their respective strategies for historicizing the Kantian framework. So we begin with Metzger and I hand over to Kari. Uh, thanks. Yes, so um, uh, Hélène Metzger uh, was a scientist in particular. Um, she had a degree in uh, chemistry and she published her first book on the history of science in 1918. Uh, the book is titled The Genesis of the Science of Crystals. She had no formal training in philosophy, but she attended classes by Leon Brunswick, André Lalande and other philosophers uh, from, from 1918 onward after she moved uh, to Paris. Uh, throughout, she was aware of the philosophical elements and implications of her studies on the history of chemistry. And in a number of essays from the 1930s, she presents the philosophical reflections that had guided her historical work. So we'll uh, focus mainly on, uh, on these uh, essays. Before turning to Metzger, I would like to um, very, very briefly discuss a little bit of the background, in particular, 
uh, the work of Leon uh, Brunswick. Uh, and I think that his work is, um, is exemplary of the particular uh, style uh, that was current at the time. Uh, so uh, Leon Brunswick, I think, can be called uh, a new Kantian, especially if we take the term in a somewhat broad sense. So, so there are, I think, similarities between his, his approach and uh, Cassirus, for instance. And like many of, the, um, of his colleagues, including uh, Cassirer, Brunswick aimed to preserve the anti-positivist strand of Kant's philosophy, but at the same time, he also um, uh, aimed to historicize Kant's account of the categories. Yeah, so we find this uh, impulse uh, both in, in Germany and of course also um, uh, in, in France. Um, but Brunswick was a philosopher and he took a very philosophical um, approach to the history of the sciences. So in his view, the history of the sciences should be studied by philosophers because we uh, get to know something about scientific thought as such by studying the historical um, development of thought. Uh, so this is quote one uh, on your handout. I hope everyone has seen it. So I'll read, on, I'll read only the final part. Uh, so Brunswick writes in 1923, uh, our positive and precise object is there for the discovery of an intellectual consciousness uh, constituted by the progressive connection, which at each moment be bears witness to its own adequacy as well as its historical development. So um, Brunswick focuses on the... Um, progressive development of scientific rationality as such. Yes, and he thinks that by doing so, we can um, get clearer on uh, human rationality uh, more broadly. Now, the same position can also be found by uh, Metzger. So I think that in this regard, she shares um, uh, the approach of Brunswick uh, and others. So this can be seen from quote two on your handout. She writes, and this is uh, from an essay uh, uh, written in 1937 called The Philosophical Method in the History of Science. When I speak of the history of science, I'm talking about the history of scientific thought and nothing else. We shall aim to understand the human mind better and by means of this very knowledge, to use our intelligence more wisely and less empirically than we have done so far. However, um, we are more interested in the way in which Metzger departs from her colleagues at the Sorbonne at the time. And one of her criticisms and maybe her main criticism is that uh, her colleagues um, focused on those aspects of the history of the sciences that confirmed their own understanding of scientific rationality and its progressive actualization. And so she objects to this uh, uh, approach be, because she thinks that in this way, the heterogeneity of the various ways in which scientists tackle particular problems uh, was obscured. And so she thinks that we uh, in our philosophical uh, approach to the history of science, should also pay attention to the, uh, to the heterogeneity of positions, but in particular also to assumptions that appear irrational from our, our point of view. Yes, so we should not focus exclusively on those elements that we recognize as it were as rational, but should also pay attention to types of reasoning uh, and practices that seen from our perspective are not rational. Uh, quotation uh, three on your handout. Now, Metzger makes a further distinction, namely between the explorative phase of a particular science on the one hand and the reflective phase uh, on the other hand. And the explorative phase of a science is in her view, uh, um, well, quite diverse and we find these heterogeneous 
um, assumptions and principles and methods, in particular in this first um, phase. Yes, that is to say the phase of a science that precedes its uh, for, uh, fixation and uh, systematization. So Metzger, uh, in relation to her uh, contemporaries, broadens the perspective of historical research by uh, focusing on this first uh, phase. Yes, so science uh, in the making, as she calls it as well. So in that regard, she uh, distinguishes herself from her contemporaries. Um, secondly, a second point I want to make is that Metzger, um, even though she's critical of, of let's say, the new Kantian uh, assumption um, in, in the work of her colleagues, that she nevertheless holds that philosophy should hold on to a certain notion of the a priori. Now, this uh, is relevant at two levels. She herself, as a historian of science, uh, is aware of her own a priori, yes, that she brings to the material in her capacity as historian, including her distinction between the explorative phase and the reflective phase that I've just mentioned. However, she also uh, focuses on a priori elements that are um, at work in the history of the sciences um, itself. And it is in this sense that her approach, I think, is clearly indebted to Kant and the new Kantian tradition. However, also in this regard, Metzger goes beyond this tradition by again emphatically enlarging the scope of what counts as an a priori condition. Yes, so she takes over this Kantian idea uh, of a priori conditions of the possibility of experience, but she enlarges the scope of what counts as such an a priori con condition. And this is quote four on your handout that I'll read. So she has a kind of um, postulate, yes, yeah? so a kind of basic um, methodological principle of her own approach. So she postulates the a priori shall not only represent notions that are in place prior to experience and on which the description of experience relies. The a priori shall also represent the fundamental tendencies that produce these notions and that according to her are uh, only um, um, uh, potentially available in, uh, in this uh, first uh, phase of a science, of a particular science. Moreover, she holds that uh, within these fundamental tendencies, we can uh, find um, uh, tensions and even contradictory uh, approaches. Now, um, uh, one of the main a priori that she identifies as regards this uh, explorative phase is the use of analogies. And so she says that, um, that within this explorative phase, um, uh, practitioners of a particular science tend to draw a lot on um, analogical inferences, which from our point of view might uh, seem irrational. Yes, quotation five on your handout. Okay. So in, in, you see that in a sense she holds on to this Kantian notion of a priori principles that are constitutive of a particular uh, science, but then uh, broadens this notion in various regards. Now, I now turn to my final uh, step very briefly, namely the question as to, him, as to how Metzger uh, conceives of the sequence of various um, science, sciences or how she conceives of historical development more generally. Now, we have already seen that she focuses a lot on the um, a priori in plural that are constitutive of a particular um, conceptual scheme. Yes, yeah? so of course we all recognize uh, Kuhn's notion of a paradigm. Um, and so she argues that within the explorative phase, we find uh, 
um, a reliance on, on a different type of a priori than in the um, reflective phase. And she um, also thinks that if we look at the, at the succession of conceptual schemes, uh, that is to say, if we adopt an historical perspective, we are not supposed to judge a particular uh, conceptual scheme, uh, for instance, an explorative phase, in view of later developments or in view of the success of, uh, of later theories. She rather um, uh, urges us to, um, um, to do justice to the uh, coherence or to the logic of a particular conceptual scheme such as it uh, developed at a certain point in time. Uh, so this is uh, quote seven on your handout. Um, so she gives the example of Boyle, uh, who interpreted one of his own experiments in terms of the distinction between substance and accident. Yes. And see, from our point of view, there is a mismatch between his theoretical assumptions on the one hand and the uh, results of his actual experiment. But her point is that it's only from our perspective that there is this mismatch and that uh, seen from Borrell's perspective, it was completely logical to make the inferences that he did based on his own uh, findings. And so she says in quotation seven, uh, that this lack of matching between facts and theories is as it were uh, uh, constitutive and that's um, it's precisely because of this mismatch that no notion can be given an unalterable definition for eternity. It's for this reason that no theory is truly protected from a possible reformulation. It's for this reason that science evolves slowly when the scientist mentality changes equally slowly under the pressure of diverse causes and why the same science can undergo a sudden revolution when, due to the discovery of a new and fertile point of view, the scientist mentality suddenly changes. So we see from this quote that Metzger doesn't really posit that the history of the sciences uh, proceeds uh, through revolutions or rather uh, through uh, more gradual types of evolution, um, so I think she wants to be agnostic about these larger issues. And she also doesn't make any strong claims uh, about, you know, the history of science uh, as such or its particular uh, dynamic. Even so, I think that her particular way of historicizing the idea of constitu constitutive a priori implies a quite radical departure from the idea that science gradually converges toward a single ahistorical truth. Yes, so in that regard, I think that her position uh, uh, tends um, more towards relativism than both the position of her contemporaries and uh, that of later uh, historical epistemologists uh, such as Corvey and uh, Bachelard. I, I stop here and hand over to uh, Pavel. And now I'm unmuted. Okay, thanks, Karin. So uh, I begin with the relation of history of science and philosophy for Kuhn. So small topic. Um, I'm just going to approach it by way of two biographical quotations from Kuhn. The first is quote eight on the list. So he says, reflecting back on the beginnings of his intellectual journey, uh, quote, I had decided in 1948 to move into history of science with an eye to doing something philosophical with it. My notion was there was important philosophy to come out of this research. So he goes on to say that as he saw it, he could not have generated the philosophical ideas he was after by studying philosophy the way it was taught at Harvard at the time. Neither could he have done so by studying history of science uh, with Sarton, who was at Harvard also at the time. He referred to his lectures as, quote, turgid and dull, and he says, Kuhn does that, quote, there's a sort of history of science to do that Sarton was not doing. So basically he had uh, Kuhn in this, um, in this period, he had non-historical philosophers on one side, 
non-philosophical historians of science on the other. So of course he wanted to uh, combine, synthesize these two um, strands and do a philosophical history of science or to think about the history of science in a philosophical manner. Um, so what does it mean to think about history philosophically or indeed anything else? Um, well, as is pointed out in some circles, at least for Kuhn, it means to think about things in a Kantian manner, in some sense of Kantian. Uh, I think some of the commentators that draw this uh, parallel have been mentioned. I'm not going to discuss them because we can get this straight from the horse's mouth. And this is quote nine. So here's Kuhn. So he's saying, quote, my notion of paradigm uh, or structured lexicon, which is a later term, I've just for simplicity, I'm gonna stick with paradigm. My notion of paradigm resembles Kant a, Kant's a priori in its relativized sense. Both are constitutive of possible experience of the world, his italics, but neither dictates what that experience must be. Rather, they are constitutive of the infinite range of possible experiences that might conceivably occur in the actual world to which they give access. I go around explaining my position by saying I'm a Kantian with movable categories. Um, so that relates to the, I think the Kant on wheels quote was mentioned. Um, I, actually, this is a quote that Karen hates um, and I was forbidden from including it, but I thought I would sneak it in. Um, but she's right to be suspicious of this quote. Um, it's not clear that Kuhn really knows what he's talking about or that he's speaking precisely. Namely, it's very unlikely that he's referring to Kantian categories um, uh, or pure concepts of the understanding, variety of reasons, not least of all, he just was not interested in this level uh, at the level of constitution of objects of experience, despite the kind of Kantian noises he makes in that quote and elsewhere. He was interested sort of further downstream, the level of constitution of objects of scientific knowledge, conditions of scientific activity and so forth. So, Perhaps he's not using the word categories in this Kantian sense, but more generally to mean concepts. But nonetheless, that still leaves the question, is there any more specific sense in which his notion of paradigm is indeed Kantian? So I wanna take a brief, I'll try to make it as brief as possible, brief look at paradigm before we're looking at how history comes in, which is the main point, which uh, looking at the time, let's see <laughs> how that goes. Um, so locating paradigm in the Kantian framework is not at all straightforward. Uh, he uses it quite promiscuously in this in structure. Uh, one early critic counted 21 different uses, I think. More happily, in the postscript, he concedes this ambiguity and he tries to specify um, what he means by it. So his solution is to say, sometimes in structure, he used it to mean paradigm proper. Sometimes he used it to mean elements within a paradigm. So paradigm proper is rechristened disciplinary matrix now. And it refers to quote, the entire constellation of values, beliefs, techniques, and so on of a given scientific community. So he lists some of these elements in the postscript, uh, different essays at this, in this period list different kinds of elements. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's representative in some sense. So what does he list? Well. Um, in the postscript, he lists symbolic general generalizations. Oh, that's the first element. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer because this can refer to symbolic um, formulae, but also general propositions. Um, he gives the example of F equals MA in the case of the former, or quote, action equals reaction in the case of the latter. And these function as basic laws of nature, but also as definitions of the symbols they employ. Other elements in Kuhn's paradigm, models, so metaphysical models, but also heuristic models. It's quite a broad list. It can refer to metaphysical model like um, Aristotle's dynamics or something much more specific. Uh, analogies, metaphors, values. So values shared among a community of scientists and exemplars, which are something I don't want to talk about actually, but these are the sort of non-rule governed exemplary solutions to problems. It's, this is probably the most famous use of paradigm in this time, but it's just one element of the disciplinary matrix. Uh, okay, so how are we doing for time? So, well, there's this question floating around, what is Kantian about X or Y? What is Kantian about Kuhn? 
Um, so if we look at his um, conception of paradigm here, I think the answer in, in, in the details is not much. Um, so it's certainly no elements there refer to Kantian categories, a priori concepts of understanding. Symbolic generalizations uh, perhaps correspond to the principles from the metaphysical foundations. So I've picked out uh, Newtonian examples that uh, Kuhn cites for ease of identification. So to the extent that these play uh, a leading role in a paradigm, there might be some similarity to uh, the metaphysical foundations, the principles, to the extent that for Kuhn, these elements hang together in a unified system. There's some similarities to Kant's idea of system as system of proper science presented in the metaphysical foundations as elsewhere. But there are a lot of elements in Kuhn's paradigm that don't really uh, correspond to, neither to Kant's system as presented in the metaphysical foundations, nor to any a priori constitutive elements, nor indeed to any elements that are a priori at all. Um, so what is Kantian? Well, I would say probably the general idea that there is this conceptual scheme. Um, I forgot how Karin phrased it in terms of Metzger. So um, that there's uh, an a priori that precedes and partially co constitutes experience, something like that. Yeah, so that, that would probably be the Kantian element. However, there are a lot more, I think, um, Metzgerian elements in this idea of paradigm. Just to name a few that Karin has mentioned, again, Kuhn's idea of a priori is broader. It, it includes a wider range of elements as Metzger does, it's looser. So the Kantian system hangs together in a certain way. It's controversial um, how it hangs together as we saw throughout the conference, but there is a certain structure to it. The Kuhnian one, like the Metzgerian one is quite looser, uh, is a lot looser. So um, I wanna move on to the historicization bit. Um, so this is the movable part of the movable category. So in what sense are the Kantian categories movable for Kuhn? So as he puts it, he wants to historicize this framework. He wants to move from, quote, a static to a dynamic image of science. So first I want to talk about in what sense Kant's picture might be static and what Kuhn does. Um, perhaps I can abridge this, uh, shorten this discussion a bit since we're running out of time and since this came up in the Q&A in the last paper, but I want to look at this in terms of disciplinary boundaries. So as mentioned, uh, for Kant, the boundaries of a discipline are fixed by the nature of the object, specific modes of cognition, or even the ends of the science, the aims. Um, so for the empirical sciences, for example, there's two kinds of empirical object, objects of inner sense, objects of outer sense, and these determine two disciplines, psychology and physics, respectively. Now, the point, I think the main point here is that these bound, because the constitution of the object, the nature of the object is determined by the nature of reason. And reason, of course, is universal, a priori, unchanging over time. These boundaries are fixed for all time. Yes, we construct the object, but there's a right way of constructing it. And we're only doing science when we're constructing it in the right way. So I think this, of course, there are, we can misidentify and people have, um, as I think Thomas pointed out in the, in the, in the quote that he put up, so there's a lot of fumbling around. Yeah, there's false starts, but once these boundaries are set, then we're on the secure path of science. So I think the point is that for, for, for Kuhn, this fumbling around just is science. And I can't, can't think it's, it's not science. It's, it's not reaching the level of science for the reasons given. Kuhn, if it satisfies other conditions, that just is science according to a different paradigm. Uh, so that's, I think that's the point. I think that marks the big difference um, here. And I think just the last thing I want to mention, this leads to a, a different view of history. So I think Kant has this um, basically Whiggish view of history for these reasons. So he thinks, you know, once you, try, once you set on the secure path of science, you'll get, this is a quotation, constant and unending progress, end of quote, in the accumulation of knowledge. In the opposite case, you have a problematic science or non-science like metaphysics, you know, you have to go back and forth, you go back and set out on a new path, constantly starting over. So I think the secure path, it's quite faithfully corresponds to what Kuhn would call normal spot science, you know, just solving puzzles, mopping up, uh, another term that is probably not popular. <laughs> um, 
Oh, you, Pavel, you were supposed not to use the term mopping up either, right? I'm trying to sneak in, uh, sneak in uh, concepts that are, not, that are not popular. So it's just a question of mopping up. I kind of like the term mopping up. It's a sort of um, not unromantic view of scientific activity. Um, so I think that, that picture of, 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 of unending progress that Khan has corresponds quite well to Kuni in normal science. But the general picture of science you get in Kuhn is more like this herky-jerky path of metaphysics, right? Constantly starting over from the basics, from the fundamentals, um, minus this end goal, minus this sort of universal standard, according to which we can determine whether it's real science or not. So for Kuhn, obviously, discovery of new objects or anomalies in general explode the paradigm and you start over in the way that Kant thinks uh, metaphysics has had to. And Incommensurability um, means that we have to start over and start from scratch and knowledge in that sense is not cumulative. So you have the cyclical view. So for Kant, for Kant I mean, what results from his conception of, of, of science and of the disciplinary boundaries is that knowledge is cumulative, it's teleological. For Kuhn, it's non-cumulative, it's non-teleological, it's cyclical, periods of normal science alternate with periods of revolutionary science. In short, Kuhn is profoundly anti-Whiggish, and I think Kant is very uh, Whiggish on this. And this is perhaps the, the, the main difference that I wanna highlight, because again, here, uh, Kuhn is more like Metzger than like some of the uh, equally Whiggish neo-Kantians. Um, so this, this move of relativiz relativizing Kantian principles doesn't necessarily lead to this non-cumulative anti-Whiggish view. I think Kasser has been called Whiggish, and I think this um, um, other sort of uh, people who tried to take a developmental view of Kantian reason also have this kind of Whiggish view. But I think to get from there, uh, from the relativization to the non-cumulative bit, there's an extra step. And perhaps Metzger is that um, extra step for Kuhn. So, Conclusion, in a word, uh, we don't really want to argue for historical influence that Metzger's work influenced Kuhn on any of these, on either of these two issues for various reasons. But we do want to say there's more conceptual overlap between Kuhn's a priori and Metzger's a priori than between Kuhn's and Kant's on the one hand. And secondly, that his historicization strategy, Kuhn's, has more affinity with Metzger's than with some of the other neo-Kantians of the time. Um, we're a bit over time. Do you have any uh, conclusions to add to that, Karen?